Hello. My topic today is evaluation of orthodontic tooth movement path using comb beam CT. My name is Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, did my dental training at University of Maryland, got my orthodontic certificate at SUNY Buffalo, and I've been in private practice for 31 years. When we talk about the the path that the tooth needs to move to get to its final destination. Most of the conversations involve impacted cuspids. But with comb beam CT, we can actually visualize the path for a retraction of a cuspid into a class one position or any other movement. I'd like to demonstrate what I mean by evaluation of the path using three uh, clinical cases. This first case is a 29 year old male. He's class 1 on the left, class 2 on the right. He has a Bolton discrepancy and lingually locked lateral, upper lateral incisors. This is his 3D uh, uh, reconstruction using the comb beam CT DICOM file. Uh, this 3 construction uh, allows you to simulate different types of treatment. You can see that he already has some dehiscence associated with the anterior teeth. So the question here is you want to uh, correct the class two on the right hand side and make room for the upper lateral incisors to fit in the arch. Do you extract the upper right first by cuspid or do you extract the upper right cuspid? If you were going to extract the upper right uh, first by cuspid, that means you need to distalize the upper cuspid into the class one position. If you were going to extract the upper cuspid, the upper first by cuspid really doesn't need to be moved that much. One thing we look at using comb beam C is the amount of bone that surrounds the root of the tooth. How much of the circumference of the tooth is covered with bone? And we use a measurement called a total root bone coverage measurement. Now I don't have time to go into how the calculations done, it's just a relative amount of bone that covers the uh, tooth as measured from the CEJ to the apex. And this gentleman's uh, upper right cusp has about a 90% total root bone coverage, which is pretty good. The upper right first bicuspid has a 91% total root bone coverage, so they're pretty similar. You also have to consider that the root of the cusp is a little longer, so the overall amount of bone is actually more on the cusp than on the first by. But the other thing that needs to be considered is the path that the upper cusp would need to travel to get back to its final destination. Is there enough bone to support the movement of that tooth distally to class one uh, to achieve class one correction? With comb beam CT, you can look at the path uh, the, to make sure that you have enough bony highway or thickness of alveolar process to properly retract the tooth. So in this case, if you take a look at the area of the cuspid in the upper right first by, you see that he has a very thick, uh, good bony highway or thick alveolar trough to properly retract the upper cuspid into a class one position. So in this case, we extracted the upper first bicuspid. Here's what it looks, at. it looks like in three months. You can see we're retracting the cuspid to make room for the lateral and the central incisor. No bracket was put on to, on to the lateral or central until after room was made uh, to avoid round tripping. When we talk about round tripping, we, we, we flare the teeth out so that the wire can be captured in all the slots. I believe that we don't know the long-term consequences of round tripping teeth, and if it's possible to avoid it, we should avoid it. Here I simulated what it would look like to round trip the teeth, as opposed to retracting the cuspid and bypassing the lateral and central incisors. You can see from the axial view, the teeth are lined up, probably this is lined up enough so that the wire can now fit in the slot. But take a look at the difference from the coronal view or the sagittal view. The teeth are blown through the cortical plate. 
Now, we may not understand the full clinical significance or the clinical long-term significance of round-tripping teeth at this time. But if you can avoid doing it, why uh, not avoid doing it? I don't believe there's a downside to avoiding round-tripping. Here's at 10 months, we uh, put brackets on and tied in the lateral and central incisors. You can see that the, class, the cuspid now is back into a nice class one position. Here he is at 11 months. At 11 months, I took a cone beam CT and I wanted to evaluate the, the position of the upper cuspid in the bone. Also notice there's a dipping here of the bone associated with the upper right lateral incisor. So bringing that lateral incisor would be a predictable dehiscence of the alveolar bone. And you could see after 11 months, you could see we dehisced through the facial cortical plate as well as the lingual cortical plate, as well as the left lateral incisor, same thing. Here is the upper right lateral incisor, and what you would expect to happen happened. The tooth was tipped out labially to correct the anterior crossbite. Pretreatment upper right cuspid had a 90% total root bone coverage, if you remember, and after retracting it to class one, he's got about 79% total root bone coverage, which really isn't bad. Uh, you never end up with more bone than you started with when you reposition teeth. At least I haven't seen it. Uh, I've never seen more bone. You're lucky if you're close to uh, the same amount of bone when you finish. The upper right uh, lateral incisor started with 86% uh, percent total root bone coverage. And it's it, at the taking of this cone beam CT, it's at 68%. And it's still got a little bit more to go. Next case is a similar case. It's a 63-year-old uh, man. He's class one on the left, class two on the left, on the class two on the right. Uh, he has some uh, gingival tissue stripping, and he has a fraction associated with the upper right cuspid. It's the same question: Which tooth do you extract? Do you extract the upper right cuspid or the upper right first black cuspid in this case? Now, in this case, I had recommended the extraction of the upper right cuspid based on the tissue stripping and the abfraction associated with the root of the, of the tooth. Uh, I got a call from his general dentist uh, who asked me to reconsider the cuspid extraction and, and would I uh, extract the first by instead. I said, well, you know, it's an abfracted root. It's got tissue stripping. His comment was that, well, I can fix the abfraction. With bonding. So when the patient came back, I discussed it with him. The, the patient was dead set against having the uh, cuspid extracted. And at this time, at this point, this was early on in cone beam uh, for me, I wasn't looking at the path the tooth needed to travel. So we extracted the upper right uh, first by cuspid. On the lower, we did a fairly aggressive interproximal reduction scheme. You can see there, these the upper cuspid and the upper first by are about the same. They're both about 59% total root bone coverage. Here's what he looked like um, about a few months before uh, debonding was treated with incognito lingual appliances. Now, what I want you to look at is the bony defect associated with the upper right cuspid. Do you have room to properly retract? this cuspid into the first bicuspid position or the class one position without causing further damage to the cortical plate and, and supporting bone. You know, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. So with cone beam CT, you can actually evaluate that path to see if it's safe to retract that tooth. And here's uh, the case 12 months post-treatment. This is what he looks like a year after the brace are removed. Everything looks pretty good. Uh, the tissue stripping he started with is pretty much the tissue stripping that he ended up with. You can see here, you got that fraction. Maybe it's a little bit worse than he, than he started, but it, you know, it lined up well. The reconstructed cephalometric x-ray really gives you no indication of what was done in terms of bone tooth root support. You take a look at the lower right lateral incisor. What you expect would have happened happened. The tooth tipped forward slightly. 
still in very good position and, and good decent bone. The upper right lateral incisor, same thing. You would expect it to have a little more facial uh, crown torque. And from the axial view, the pre-treatment, you can see there's a, a dipping in of the bone associated with the defect. And after 12 months post-treatment, you can see that same defect is present, maybe even a little worse. You take a look at the total root bone coverage associated with the upper right cuspid. It went from 59% to 36 or 37%. Now that may not be clinically significant. Uh, at the current time, we don't know where what this what the threshold is for total root bone coverage, but it is substantially reduced. And I feel if I were to treat this case again, I would have given more emphasis to the path and extracted the upper right cuspid. The uh, lower right lateral incisor uh, started with 69% total root bone coverage and uh, ended with a 67% total root bone coverage, which is, which is pretty good. This third case is a 19-year-old boy. He uh, is already missing teeth 5, 12, and 21. And this is how he presented to our office. The question here is, which upper teeth do you extract? Do you extract the upper cuspids or the first bicuspids? This is his pan and ceph. Really does not give you any additional information to help make that clinical decision. When you look at the uh, comb beam CT, the upper right cuspid has about a 61% total root bone coverage compared to about 67% for the upper right first bicuspid. But just like the other cases, the path at tooth number six or the upper right cuspid needs to travel to get to its final destination should be a consideration. If you take a look, I tipped this 3D reconstruction so you can see there's really no way to retract this cuspid back without destroying additional cortical plate. So in this case, um, based on the path that the upper cuspids need to travel, I pulled out the upper, I extracted the upper cuspids versus the upper first bodies. You can see the width, the width of this tooth. It's just not going to fit back in that area. And here's what he looks like 12 months into treatment. Everything's lined up. Uh, there does not appear to be any additional tissue stripping. Unfortunately, this patient disappeared right after I took these photos, and I haven't seen him for about a year and a half. So hopefully he'll come back and I can take his braces off and take another cone beam CT and see if I made the right decision. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can always email me at ortho606 at gmail.com. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.